everyone to today's uh, International Invest Problems Seminar. So we are very happy today to have Erki Somersalo, which will be talking about basin inversion and data side methods to identify changes in brain activity during meditation from MEG measurements. So that was a long, but a very interesting title. <laughs> yeah, that's... So yeah, that was a sort of non-typical title for math talks, and so because we usually don't uh, be so descriptive. So yeah, thank you for for the the invitation and the opportunity to talk in this this uh, exciting seminar series. So uh, let me see my how my connect. Right. Okay. So yeah. Oh yeah. All right. So so this this work is mainly based on uh, on a couple of papers that are, have been published in, in brain topography. So this is a long project that um, uh, we have been involved with with colleagues in in at the University of Rome, La Sapienza, and uh, partly inspired by by this uh, this work, Daniel and I studied to the tease this course on data science, and so that. Uh, Turned out to be material for the book that you see, the Siam book. So, uh, so I'm talking about meditation. So meditation is uh, and mindfulness meditation has been a big topic in in, in recent years uh, because people see it as a as a possibility to to do a non pharmaceutical intervention in in uh, problems like chronic pain and depression. And uh, so this is from New York Times Magazine, just to show you that this is really mainstream stuff. I saw you a disturbing picture from, I think, 63. So this, this uh, Buddhist monk uh, was protesting against the, the, the bad treatment of, of uh, uh, Buddhists in, in South Vietnam. In, in, uh, um, yeah, I was in was Saigon. And so, but the interesting thing about this picture is you look at the face of that monk. So he's experiencing enormous pain and agony and and you can show no trace in his face so he is a theravada buddhist so he was a professional meditator and so clearly as we know the the uh, um, professional meditators are able to to shut down completely the the, the sense of of pain and, and agony and so now it's interesting to know what is happening in the brain so uh, the, the problem is that the most of the, um, you know, information about what is happening in the brain is, is kind of a self-reporting. And so it'd be nice to know if there is really a, like a physiological change in the, the brain activity during meditation, in particular, in which parts of the brain the changes occur. And so we had uh, the opportunity to have uh, access to this uh, MEG recording, so magnetoencephalography recordings of, of, of 12 Theravada Buddhist monks during uh, sessions. So they were doing like 15 minutes, eyes close, Samantha, which is a focused attention meditation, and then Vipassana, which is the open monitoring meditation. And so the question now is, can we see where the changes in the brain activity takes place when they are switching from one state to another? Um, MEG is uh, a non-invasive uh, uh, brain uh, imaging modality where you measure the magnetic field outside the head and you need to calculate the brain activity, the electric activity that's inducing that magnetic field uh, from that data. So uh, we have 153 sensors. This data was collected by University of Kiev in Italy. And so we had a discretization of the head where you have 41,000 possible current dipole sources. So we are, we are discretizing the, the activity by representing it as dipoles. And we also had the MRI uh, image of the brain. What is the problem? We, we need to, to have a relatively fast solver, which is also able to discern the, the different brain regions and uh, go deep into the brain. Um, uh, so, so that we can see what what is what is happening. So the the, the velocity at which uh, with MEG is, is is doing the recording is is, is uh, uh, one measurement per millisecond. So you get every millisecond a new data set. And so if you want to go and, and analyze minutes of 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 monitor this uh, 
meditation, you, you need to have a rather fast system. So, so this was a motivation where we started to look at this MEG problem. So there are, of course, lots of solvers available to, to, to MEG, but we found that they were not doing what we really wanted. And so we started to look our own solver. So, so we start with Maxwell's equations, uh, quasi-static Maxwell's equation. And if you if you write uh, the Biot-Savart law, you see that the magnetic field is, is an integral operator from the total current. The total current cons consists of two parts. So there's the impressed current J, which we are interested in. And then there's the volume current. And the volume current is just the, the, the ohmic response of the material in the head to, to the, to the uh, electromotoric force of, of, of J. And so you need to solve this, this rather simple uh, linear differential equation to get the, the voltage potential. Then you plug it in back, you see that this B at the end is a linear, uh, uh, it it's depends linearly on the, on the impressed current. So I'm not going too much into details here, but I'm just showing you this picture. So we, we uh, discretized the head using the boundary element method and so, if you have a dipole, which you see on the left, then you calculate using boundary element method, the, the voltage potential. And once you have the voltage potential, you get this, this M and M picture. So these are the, the magnetometer, uh, normal component of the magnetic field at, at the magnetometer. So, so, so this, this uh, right side shows you how the data looks like and, and the left side is what you would like to know. Okay, so that's said. Um, we have a linear problem and doing all this, this analysis, you get the matrix L that maps your dipoles to the magnetic fields normal component. So, so Q1, Q2, etc. they are three vectors representing the dipoles at given locations in discrete locations in, 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 in the brain. Um, sigma is not that well known. So there are modeling errors in our model. Fortunately, the MEG data, unlike EEG data is not that sensitive to the, to the conductivity. So, so even if you get the conductivity slightly right, incorrectly, um, you still can do a decent job with this model. The, the modeling error has been analyzed separately, but this is not part of my talk. Um, so we are approaching this using the Bayesian uh, uh, approach because we have a prior information that we want to, to incorporate. So, so all unknowns in the Bayesian approach are, are modeled as random variables and the randomness expresses the lack of the certainty about the value. So there's not nothing intrinsically probabilistic, but, but since we don't know the values, we model them as random variables. Um, and so the likelihood is the, the, the tool that connects the measurement to your uh, unknowns. And so if we assume that our noise is additive and Gaussian, so then the likelihood is just a, a Gaussian distribution, uh, exponential of one half minus the, let's call it Mahalanobis distribution of your data and the computed output. And so, so sigma is the, the positive definite covariance matrix here. So that's the likelihood we are simply assuming Gaussian noise. Now, uh, prior model is the, the tool that, that you uh, import your prior information into the, the system. And so the um, typical Bayes formula says that the posterior distribution of Q given B is proportional to the prior distribution of Q where you have all the prior information about the activity times the likelihood. So you can think that, that this uh, likelihood is just a way to update your prior information so that you get the posterior distribution. Okay, so this is this is the, the famous uh, ubiquitous base formula. So now we need to build the um, prior. So what do we know about the, the uh, distribution Q? Uh, so First of all, we are going to use uh, a parameter dependent Gaussian prior. So there are reasons, computational reasons why we prefer Gaussian priors because that makes computations easy. However, if you just take a Gaussian prior where you have the covariance matrix fixed, uh, the um, prior models are typically too rigid. What we want here is to, to implement some sort of sparsity. 
So we want that only few dipoles at the time are active. So that's what we assume that that is the case. And so we want to follow how the, how the activity moves in the head from brain region to another. So what we have found useful here is to use a hierarchical uh, parameter dependent uh, Gaussian model. So we say that we take a um, um, diagonal matrix D theta and uh, we multiply our Q vector with that, that uh, or block diagonal actually, uh, this, this Q. And so we write the Gaussian prior where we have the, the matrix D depending on an extra parameter theta. And I will show you soon what this data is. But for the time being, uh, we also don't want to fix that uh, matrix D theta. So we assume that this theta is also an unknown. And so therefore we are building a hierarchical model where we uh, take the joint prior density of Q and theta by first writing the conditional Gaussian prior for Q and then introduce a hyper prior for theta. All uh, details will be shown to you soon. And uh, so then if you, if you have this, this situation, so we want to estimate both Q and theta from the data. And so therefore we write the posterior distribution, not only for Q, but also for theta. So we write the posterior probability density for Q and theta to be the likelihood times the conditional distribution of Q given theta times the hyper prior of, of theta. And uh, it would be lovely to do uncertainty quantification here, but in order to at least get some sort of results, we are restricting ourselves to get only the maximum a posteriori estimate, which is the maximizer of the posterior distribution. Okay, so what, has, what, what is the information? How do we, how do we enter, enter this, this, uh, this information in this, this hierarchical model? So first of all, we have anatomical information. So, so uh, when this MR, MEG measurement is, is done, uh, uh, an MRI scan of the, of the subject is also performed. And so we know the anatomy of the brain. And so there is a certain preferential direction in certain brain regions for the dipoles of the electric currents to occur. For instance, if you look at hippocampus, hippocampus is very nicely organized uh, brain region. And so is the cortical part of, of brain. And so we know that there's a preferential re di direction for the dipoles. So, so the dipoles are typically parallel to, the, to the, the neuron bundles. And so what we do is we, at each point where we discretize, we say that the variance of the dipole activity should be large in one direction, which I denote by U3, and the variance in orthogonal directions should be significantly lower. So I'm, I'm using a parameter delta here to, to uh, indicate that I'm assuming that the variance in the, in the orthogonal directions is, is smaller than in the in the in the normal direction. So uh, so we are not forcing the dipoles to have a preferential direction. We are just saying that there is a there is a preferential direction. So this u1, u3, u u2, u3 is a, is a local orthonormal triplet. Okay. So each dipole has this this local covariance matrix, and so then what we do then is we say that um, the variance of, of this uh, uh, Q transpose C inverse Q at each point is unknown. So the variance is theta J. So at each point we are saying that we have the preferential direction, but we don't know what the, what the variance is. So theta represents the, the variance of the, of the, um, the norm the weighted norm of, of the, the, the dipole activity. So I'm writing this uh, uh, conditional density. So I'm assuming that this, each dipole is, is independent because we want to, to have focal sources. So that we don't want to, to have, use any smoothness type prior here because, because we expect the, the dipoles to, look, to, to be... Um, so we want to have the opportunity that a single dipole is active and the neighbors are not. And so we use independency here. Um, so that leads to, to a local uh, prior model for each dipole, which is, which is given, given here, and the unknown variance is, is included in the, in the model. Um, 
Okay, so how do we design the, the hyper prior for the, the variance? So uh, what we assume here is that, that most of the dipoles are silent or almost silent, but we have some outliers. So that means that, that we want the probability distribution for thetas which favor small values, but allow significant outliers. And that typically in, in statistics uh, amounts to defining a heavy tailed prior. And so we choose a, a heavy tailed prior, which is a gamma distribution for theta. So if you draw from gamma distribution, you typically see that the, the, the most of the, the um, realization have a small value and every now and then you have, a, have an outlier. So that's, that's the, the, the heuristics behind choosing this, this hyper prior here. There are two parameters here. There's this beta parameter, which is called the shape parameter, and there is a scale parameter, theta star. So now you say, okay, so this is turtles all the way. So you are just pushing forward, you know, the, the, the decision, how you, how you choose the parameters. It turns out that there is a very good uh, rationale how to choose this beta and also how to, how to choose this theta star. And you will see that soon. So, so now I have this, uh, this, uh, this uh, gamma family in my hyper prior. Now I start to put everything together. So remember, we have likelihood and that is here. So the first part is likelihood. Then we have the, the prior, local prior. So each dipole has its, its preferential direction and an unknown variance. And then we have the, the, the hyper prior part, which comes from the gamma distribution. And then we have this logarithmic term here, term here which is partly coming from the, from the uh, prior and partly from the hyper prior. And if you want to maximize this uh, posterior distribution, or oh, eta is, is, is related to the shape parameter of the gamma. So if you want to maximize this, uh, this posterior distribution, it's equivalent to minimizing the, the Gibbs energy, which is the negative of the, the, the logarithm of your posterior. <clears throat> and so now I have written this, this D theta here, or this, this prior term here slightly differently. So I'm having a block diagonal matrix D theta, where I have uh, the, uh, local anatomical prior matrices at the diagonal multiplied by the, the variance. And so here this D, remember, appears as D inverse. So that amounts to calculating one over theta J. So it looks slightly complicated. However, this, this uh, objective function that we want to minimize has a nice structure and you see the, the structure here. So we are going to do an alternating minimization. So there is one part that depends on Q, the two first terms, and there is one part that depends on theta, which is the last two terms here. And so what we are doing, we are uh, moving ahead by minimizing the Q dependent part, keeping theta fixed. You have a new Q, and then you are minimizing the theta dependent part, keeping Q fixed. And so you alternate these two iteration schemes. Uh, so first of all, we can show that this iteration scheme converges. There's a unique local minimum for this, this functional. And um, moreover, the, the implementation is, is, is very simple. So if you look at the, the Q dependent part, it's a quadratic functional. So we know how to solve that. If you look at the theta part, you see that it is, the thetas are independent. So we can, we can uh, minimize for each theta j independently. And actually there's a closed formula for the minimizer for the theta part. So that makes the algorithm very, very effective. Now, so here is a theorem that I, I, I told you. So this uh, algorithm converges to a unique minimizer. We also know that the minimizer Q hat, theta hat, uh, satisfy the fixed point condition. So theta hat is going to be a function of Q hat, which is given in the, in the last row. And so equivalently, you can think that we are minimizing a functional, which is depending only on Q. So this theta in some sense is just an auxiliary parameter here. Um, okay. so. 
So, so we have an algorithm that, that converges and it does its, its, its job. Uh, so how does the solution look like? So now let's go to the parameters. So remember this eta was given um, here. Yes, eta is beta minus five over two. So I'm choosing my eta to be positive, And it turns out that if I let my eta go to zero, the map estimates converges to the minimizer of the uh, uh, functional where the penalty is a, is a group L1 penalty. So, so here we don't have the square, we have the norm of QJ, the, the Mahalanov is norm of Q, QJ. So this is a weighted L1 penalty. And such a penalty is called a minimum current estimate in MEG literature. And so we see that, that when eta is small, we are approximating the minimum current estimate. So eta clearly is a parameter that controls the focality of the solution because this minimization problem leads to a sparse solution. So we have a, we have a way to, to, to um, decide how to, how to choose this eta. So that is a handle for us to, to control the, the focality of the solution. So what about this theta star here? Theta star is the, the shape parameter and uh, I don't want to choose that by hand. So, so we have to have some criteria on how to choose that. And so we were analyzing this, this expression and we came up with the, with, an, um, with the condition which has to do with exchangeability in, in probability theory. So, so <clears throat> suppose you have an estimate for the signal to noise ratio of, of the MEG signal which is the expectation of the magnetic field power divided by the noise power. And so suppose that you're looking at the signal to noise ratio, assuming that you know the, the uh, support of Q, meaning you know which dipoles are active. So we defined what is now what we call the, the signal to noise ratio exchangeability condition saying that uh, the problem satisfies the signal to noise ratio exchangeability condition if the estimated signal to noise ratio is independent of how you choose the active set. So, so this looks very natural from the point of view of, of, of physiology. We don't want to give any preference to any particular uh, dipoles. So if you, if you say that we have five dipoles which are active, I should be able to, in, to interchange those five dipoles and choose them, choose them freely. And so we are saying basically here that any sets that have the same cardinality should result in the same estimated signal to noise ratio. So that's our, our exchangeability condition. If you require that exchangeability condition to be valid, it turns out that your theta star has to be chosen by the condition. It's, it's a constant divided by the norm squared of the L, uh, the j, j uh, column of your um, of your of your forward map. So, in fact, this is slightly uh, incorrect now because here I was assuming that the signal is a scalar signal. So, in our case, you should have the here the Frobenius norm of the of the three block of your forward map. But so so the basic idea is here that the theta theta star is can be chosen directly from your forward map if you want this, this exchangeability condition to be, be valid. And so, so there is a parameter which is sort of expressing your belief how the number of dipoles, active dipoles is distributed in your model. So it turns out that this is, this is actually a Bayesian justification of something that has been used in, in both in geophysics and in, in biomedical imaging namely, um, so we know that um, the data may be less sensitive to some sources than to others. And so uh, in geophysics, this idea has been, has been known. So if you, if you don't uh, give any weight for your um, unknowns, typically the inverse, regularized inverse solvers are trying to explain the data, pushing the sources to the surface of the 
of the of the ground if you're measuring on the surface of the ground same way if you are if you're measuring uh, data outside the head so typically the sources that explain the data have the tendency to come to the to the to the surface and so a weighting arg ar ar argument has been has been used uh, in in the literature but there has not been a really good explanation where this weighting comes from so so now we have sort of Bayesian justification which is coming from this the signal to noise ratio uh, exchangeability so so we were happy to see that that we can actually get something which is you know um, shared by many many researchers as a, as a, as a reasonable scheme um, so now we do the, the the inversion and so then we have all the all the activities so every millisecond we get a new activity pattern in the brain and so so now we have to make sense of that that data so we have 153 sensors and we have 45 41,000 possible current dipoles um, the algorithm I'm not discussing here uh, in detail so we made this this uh, least quest part you know updating data uh, really fast by using using certain prior condition Krilov subspace methods with early stopping so so um, there's a little bit of numerical analysis hidden here but so our form our uh, inversion algorithm is, is relatively fast and so um, we are not really interested in single dipoles. We are really interested in brain regions. So we took a brain atlas of 165 functional regions of interest in, in the head. And so then we calculate the, 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 the average of the activity over those brain regions. And so then we wanted to use data science tools to, to analyze what is, what is happening in the brain. Um, so here is basically the, the idea of, of what we did uh, with, with bootstrapping. So, so uh, on the left, you see the N brain regions, 165 brain regions, and, and each line here corresponds to the, the, the result brain activity. So if you look at the brain activity, this is actually a real solution. So you see that it's pretty hard to see what is going on there. So what we decided to do is we, we did chose a window of, of length N, and we sample randomly the the uh, multi-channel data. And then we calculate uh, Fourier transforms of, of each one of those windows. So those are the periodograms. And if you take the expectation of those periodograms, you get the, the power spectrum of the, of the, of the brain. So, um, so uh, the, the idea is that if you look single time slices, you don't really understand anything about the activity in the brain. So, so the analog is that if you take a text and you try to figure out what language it is, looking just uh, the letters doesn't, doesn't tell you much, but if you take the window and look at the words, you, you start to see what language you may be talking about. So we were interested in, in four uh, activity bands. So these are the, the physiological uh, brain wave bands, theta waves, alpha waves, beta waves, and gamma waves. And so those are the, 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 the windows. Um, um, and I will show, I'm, without going too much into these numbers, I'll show you some pictures so it's easier for me to explain. Um, so, so here is the, the, the Fourier analysis. So, so if you take a vector y, which is a multi-channel, vector so then you calculate the, the Fourier transform the, the discrete Fourier transform over a window of length n you take the, the the square of that so that's called a periodogram so this is a random variable and the expectation is the the, the power spectral density and we are not really interested in the power spectral density we are really interested in these Fourier these uh, uh, single samples so these these periodograms which are random variables so we we treat these periodograms as data and so then we use data data science tools to to figure out what these periodograms tell us and um, so so here's a six schematic picture so we have uh, samples which are these bootstrapped pieces of of the signal so that's my x-axis in the y-axis, I have the, the regions of interest. So we have N, 
brain regions. And in the, in the depth direction, I have the frequency. So I'm, I'm analyzing the data at each frequency. So you start with the, with the DC component, nu equals zero, and then you have the whole spectral information. So, so, so this is the stack of data that we have. And so, so this, is, this is pretty large because we have 153 brain regions. We have, I think, 20,000 um, or 200,000 maybe um, samples and, and, and lots of frequencies. Okay, so um, the MEG data is, is pre-processed. So, so um, in order to, to, to take away the, the eye movement and the heartbeat and, and that sort of things, uh, independent component analysis has been, has been used to, 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 to filter them out. And so when you do the filtering, you may change the, the, the total power of the, of the signal. So, so the, the power itself is not the reliable variable. And so therefore we scale the, the uh, periodograms and the power spectra by the, by the DC so that we are not really looking at something which is which is result of the filtering rather than, than the, the meditation. And so, so here is what we do. So we take these periodograms, we uh, uh, scale them by the DC periodogram, and then we integrate over an interval in the in the frequency range so that we integrate over the, the alpha band, beta band, gamma band, and theta band. So my data vectors are going to be these integrals, which are approximated by, by, by quadrature simply. <clears throat> so, so I have a, um, data which looks like a, like a huge matrix where this I is referring to the, the, uh, the bands. So we have four different bands that we are looking at. Okay, so you, you can think that now we have processed the data into, into vectors where we have uh, 165 attributes that correspond to the brain regions. And then we have lots of, lots of samples. And we have that also for different meditation states. So just to show you how the, how the data looks like. So after we have solved the inverse problem and we calculate the, the, the scaled power spectra. So this is, um, I'm showing you some channels. So, so this, here is uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the, the gyrus and sulcus of the occipital um, lower left part of the brain. And so what you see here is that there is this nice spike at the theta band. There's a spike in the alpha band. And, and beta band. So this alpha is, of course, important. You will know that when you close your eyes, you will see a, a, an elevated alpha activity. And so what was surprising is that we don't see any gamma spike here. So, so for some reason, uh, the data doesn't show the gamma spike. But so that may be a reason, the outcome of, 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 of the filtering process. I'm not sure about that. But nevertheless, so we, we integrate over the, 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 the bandwidths so that we get the, the relative power in each one of those, those bands in our data. So here is uh, uh, Samatha, which is the, the focused attention meditation. So, so you can compare. So this is high activity uh, brain uh, activity state. So focused attention is, 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 a, is a really active brain state. And then you look at the Vipassana, which is the open monitoring. And so this is sort of a low activity state. So there is a, some visible changes in the, in the activity patterns, as you can see. So what we wanted to do is to, we decided to use a, the linear discriminant analysis, which is one data analysis tool to see if different data sets differ from each other. And it also gives you tools to analyze where those data sets are different. So I'm trying to give you an overview of the, of the method. So, so the idea is that suppose you have three data matrices. So this is the resting state data. This is the uh, uh, focused attention data. And this is the, the open monitoring data. So what we do first, we calculate the, for each state. So I now refers to the state. So we calculate first the mean over all column vectors in my x, 
then we subtract the mean. So we are centering the data and we are defining what is known as uh, within cluster scatter matrix. So you can think that this is some sort of variance. And now we have, yeah. Uh, and so then we have this uh, between clusters um, scatter matrix where I'm replacing all my data by the cluster mean. And so in LDA, the goal is to try to find a projection direction in which the clusters look as dif different as possible, but they look as compact as possible. So what you would like to do is to, to um, maximize the, the spread in the, in the between clusters scatter while minimizing the uh, within cluster scatter. And so this is done by looking at the, at the ratio of those two uh, spreads and we are maximizing that. So, so one is maximized, the other is minimized. It turns out that this, this, this um, so here is, a, here is a schematic picture. So suppose you have three groups of data. So you're first centering each one of those groups. So the, here is the, here's the picture. And so then you are trying to make this, this center group as compact as possible. So you're trying to find the direction in your space in which the projection is as compact as possible. So that's the minimization of the within uh, cluster scatter. And the other uh, uh, spread matrix was that you are replacing the whole group by the, 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 the cluster mean. And then you're trying to make those points to look as different as possible. So you're trying to find the direction in the space where the projection of these three points here with the, with the appropriate weights uh, look as distant as possible from each other. And so, so here is a schematic picture of if you have two clusters, so the, the principal component analysis will give you the direction where the, where the data has the maximum spread. So that would be this direction here, the blue direction. But you see that in that case, your two histograms, which is the projected data, they are overlapping. While in LDA, you're looking for the direction where your clusters look as compact as possible and as separate as possible. So this is what we try to do. Now, so we try to find a direction in the 165 dimensional space that gives us the best separation of these three meditation states. And uh, <clears throat> so in this, this analysis, we are, we are limiting ourselves to, to just one minute uh, meditation for each um, uh, state. Remember, we have one millisecond separation, so there's lots of lots of lots of data there. And so um, we looked at two different uh, meditators. So we, we selected two two monks that had let's say the cleanest MEG data. So so some of them had problems with the data, they had been moving the head and uh, the registration was not, not so good. So we, we tried to select the, the, the two cleanest of the, of the data sets. And we do the LDA analysis just to see that, can we separate those, those uh, meditation states? And once we have uh, confirmed that it is possible to separate, then we are asking, what does that separation direction that LDA gives me what does it tell about the brain states? So we want to identify the brain regions where the differences appear. <clears throat> okay, so, so first of all, the windowing is important. So if you take a really small window, so this is 20 milliseconds. In 20 milliseconds, so these are scatter plots of the, of the, of the, of the data, the three different data types to the directions of, of LDA. So LDA, I'm, I'm finding two, uh, separating directions using LDA, and then I'm projecting my data in those two directions. And when I'm increasing the window, I realize that the window is 2000 milliseconds. We start to get a really nice separation. So that picture tells me that it is possible to separate between those data types. And, and, and clearly this indicates that there is a way to tell that. So in which, which meditative state each meditator is. So this is the first message. And you see that we can do this in, in different bands and with different 
meditators so we have subject a and subject b and we have in the first row we have the theta band we have alpha band we have beta band we have gamma gamma band so so even in the gamma band where we didn't have any any spike we still see in the in the power spectrum um, there is enough information to separate between those three meditative states so now we know that it's possible to separate. So now the question is, what does that separation tell us? <clears throat> so I give you an example, which is, which is a known example, uh, which is called uh, the Fisher phase separation. So this is a data set that comes from um, a database, which is called Yale phase data. So, so what they have in this database, they have 15 or maybe yeah, 15 individuals who have been photographed with different expressions uh, on their face, and so so then you can you can test your data science algorithm with this data. So here you see two sets of faces. Uh, the difference being that in one the persons they are wearing uh, eyeglasses, and the other one they don't. And so now my question is: let's let's use LDA to figure out which pixels in these pictures are separating the 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 the, the pictures from the left from those at the right. And you would expect, expect that the, the uh, focus should be somehow on the around the eyes because that's where the, the major difference is. Okay, so if you do the LDA analysis, this is what you get. So, so this is the famous Fisher face. So, so um, what I'm plotting here on the on the right is the uh, uh, direction vector in which the difference between the two data sets is maximum. So remember this, this direction vector is a vector in the data space. So I can interpret that vector as a member of that data space. And so I can translate it to, to an image. And when you look at this picture, you see that indeed the, the, the maybe the largest uh, uh, components are, are around where you expect it to be. So, so around the eyes, of course, there is something around the, the head because the face is not completely stable from picture to picture. So there's a little bit of movement and you will see around the head also some, some differences. But, but overall, you, you can tell that the pixels around the eyes are those that separate the faces with glasses and without glasses. And so the same idea here we are using for the brain region. So we are looking at these, these uh, three uh, uh, data sets and we are asking which brain regions are those that show most prominently in the LDA direction. And uh, so, <clears throat> so what we do, we, we do uh, data reduction. So we first run the LDA and then we identify the brain regions corresponding to the largest uh, components in the LDA direction. We reduce the model. So suppose you find that the, the, the projection to, to hippocampus and let's say insula are really large in the in the in the LDA direction. So I'm, I'm throwing away other brain regions. I'm keeping only hippocampus and insula. I'm, I'm running a new uh, LDA analysis. So we're doing we are doing some sort of filtering. So we are we are discarding brain regions that are not informative from the point of view of separating between the meditative states. And so when we do this, this analysis, so you can follow row by row how the number of unknowns is reduced. So we start with 165. The first reduction, we are reducing the model to, to 40 brain regions. Then we are reducing to three, 30 brain regions. And the last reduction is not reducing really the brain regions. So we still have all three, 30. But so you see that we get from 165 down to maybe at maximum 50 brain regions, which are significant in the separation of the brain activity. And so we did this. Remember, we had uh, three states for two meditators. So um, you can choose the, the resting state in two different ways, taking meditator one or meditator two, you can take the, the, the focused attention brain state in two ways and uh, the 
open monitoring state in two ways. So we have eight different protocols. So we are running with all eight combinations, this analysis. And then we are just listing which brain regions seem to be consistently present in this LDA, LDA analysis so that, so that we see that there is a, there's a major difference, let's say. And we did this, this analysis and uh, I'm not uh, going to go in, in details here, but so this is, this is how the analysis looks like. So we had the theta band, alpha band, beta band, and gamma band. And so we are counting here in the rows how many times the corresponding brain region appears in the LDA directions. And if you have a number eight, you can be sure that that brain region plays a great, great role in, 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 in the separation because it seems to appear in, in whichever combination you were looking at in the, in the separation process. And so we listed those brain regions which, which are sort of above a threshold. I believe we, we were interested only in those which are, which are more than five times present. So here are the, the uh, uh, inner regions of the brain. And no, this is yeah, so this, this are left and right. And so here are, here are the, the sort of the, the deep brain regions. And um, let me summarize what we found. So, here, um, so this is subject to. So let me summarize what we found with this analysis. It, it turned out that uh, the, the region of interest that consistently seem to be separating the, between the, the brain states are, are regions which are related to cingulate cortex and uh, pericalosal sulcus and insula and some internal structures, accumbens, caudate, utamen, striatum, thalamus, and amygdala. Notice, however, that there's only one amygdala, the left amygdala. Is kind of the good amygdala, so so, which is related to positive feelings and and uh, well, the, the the right is more like like anxiety and 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 fear and that sort of thing. So so there's a there's a really a nice correspondence between what we found with what has been known before about uh, the effect of meditation when uh, morphological changes in the brain of uh, meditators have been looked at. So, so people have analyzed using MRI. They have taken MRI picture of a person who is not meditating and then the person comes back after a long meditation period and you see that there is some morphological changes in the brain. Turns out that what we find is, is pretty much in line with that. So, so, so here are the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the cingulate, cingulate cortex, which is, which, is, which is deep down here in, in brain. And what is cingulate cortex uh, related to? Um, we know that it is related to emotion formation and processing, learning and memory, role in executive function and respiratory control. Well, this respiratory control was great because that's exactly what the, what the uh, focused attention is. You are, you are concentrating on, 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 on uh, respiration. Um, another region that, that was interesting was, was insula. And there's lots of uh, discussion about the role of uh, insula in, in what is known as interoception, which is the perception of, of, of self. So it's, it's, it's related to <clears throat> the mapping somatic states, emotional cognition, and this was great, pain perception and process. And remember the, the photograph that I showed to you. So, so if you somehow can control your insula, you can control how you feel pain. And so, so clearly the fact that we see that the insula is involved in, in this, this, this brain activity is pointing towards um, you know, meditation being able to, 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 to control pain. And so this perception of self, perception of self and in, interoception, that's, that's really also in line with what, with, in what, in what, what, is, what is written about meditation. Um, so now here are some internal structures of brain which seem to be also decisive and, and seem to be affected by the meditation. So, so there is, um, especially the interesting thing is that we see the left 
amygdala, but not the right amygdala. So meditation does not, it seems, to activate the right amygdala, but it seems to activate the, 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 the left amygdala, which is, again, in line with the, um, what, is, what is reported by the meditators, what they, what they feel. So they, 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 they report feeling this, this internal peace and, and, and relaxation. And so that's what amygdala, left amygdala is related to. Um, so what next? What, what is the, the goal of this research? So first of all, it's of course interesting to, to, to see that we can, we can separate between these, these brain states using MEG data. Um, we have a long-term, let's say, dream of what this could be used for clinically. So suppose you have a person who comes to, 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 to a medical doctor with a, um, uh, with, a, a <clears throat> with, with, a, with a, you know, stress or depression. So depression is, is a complicated thing because if it's clinical depression, depression that requires one sort of medication. If it is a manic depressive, the depressive phase of manic bipolar disorder, in that case, the medication should be really different because you, you don't want to send the people to the manic, manic phase. But at, at this point, uh, there is no clinical way of separating between uh, clinical depression and bipolar disorder. So we are hoping that MEG could provide some sort of um, fingerprint that would, would separate between those two. That would be really a big step in, in, um, in diagnosis of, of, of those disorders. We are currently looking at, at, at stroke data. So uh, people who have suffered stroke, they usually are also suffering of depression. Clearly, stroke is something that, that easily can send you to a depression. But so it would be interesting to, to see if we can see which parts of the brain are sort of functioning differently um, in the, in the post-stroke uh, situation. Chronic pain is always interesting. So there are lots of people who are suffering chronic pain. And as I, as I said, uh, the, the insulin seems to be the, the, the key component here. And there are studies where um, um, deep brain stimulation has been, has been tried to, to mitigate chronic pain. It would be great if you could do that with, with, with something less invasive. Uh, so there are lots of, lots of open avenues that, that you can go. So this is really a first baby step to, to show that you can really use MEG data to, to separate between, between resting states. I think this is my last slide. So I thank you for your attention. And, and I have maybe two minutes to answer questions. I had to run to, to, to a class. My students are waiting for me. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for a very nice talk, Eriki. So we have uh, time for a quick question. So please uh, unmute yourself if you have, if you have a question. Uh, hello. This is David Isaacson. Oh, David. Uh, hi, Erki. Great to see you. Thank you for the talk. I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, very interesting. What would the um, effects of the uh, sampling frequency? So you're going. You're looking at uh, one millisecond. Yes. So suppose you change that sampling frequency. How would that affect? Uh, your ability to distinguish the different regions. So uh, people who are looking at, at brain activity, they say that anything which is above 250 hertz is, is not significant. So- Right, this, so you're going much faster. Yeah, so this is, this is generous oversampling, so to speak. And uh, um, yes, I, we haven't, we haven't been doing any study, let's say doing subsampling, for instance. Um, some people are doing subsampling with, with the, the MEG data exactly because they claim that, you know, about 250 Hertz is not physiological, which, which probably is true. Um, you can probably do a lot with, with lower sampling frequency. 
Um, that, How would that affect the window? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So maybe maybe uh, if you if you if you have a lower sampling frequency, you might try to integrate to you know to improve the signal to noise ratio. I'm not sure. Um, so we are we are using two thousand the window size, which is which is two seconds, right? So. Um, well, I guess that that uh, the the length of the window, you know, in in um, so if you if you use two hundred and fifty hertz, uh, so then how many do you have in in two seconds? I I think that um, yeah, I don't really know. I would I would my my instinct would be that that if you fix the the length of the window in units of time, the results should be similar, but this is something that we have. Right, not. but then you would have much less work to have to do. Correct. Would you? Yes, that's right. So, so that would be certainly the, the, uh, the, the positive thing. Absolutely. Okay. So let, let me ask some, let me uh, allow somebody else to ask a question, but since you're in a hurry, uh, yes, I, I would like I, to close with the Zen comment. Uh, you cannot get it by taking thought. You cannot seek it by not taking thought. Oh, I see, okay. For, for your meditation. So, uh, so was it a question or was it a comment? No, it was just a comment to, yeah, yeah. inspired yeah. by the meditation and the Zen monk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, but it I, does. It also applies to solving mathematical problems. It is true, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I would talk to you a lot more about this because you stimulated a lot of good questions. Yeah, but, I'm, uh, I'm, let me let somebody else speak. Yeah, I'm. I'm happy to 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 answer questions later with better time. But as I said, I need to run to the class right now. So, so, okay. so if you don't mind my my vanishing and. So, so send me email. I mind, but you can go. Okay, okay, so, sorry. Yeah, thanks. So. Okay, well, thanks a lot, uh, Eric, again, for a very nice talk. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, this was stimulating uh, the brain activity, so people may have more questions, uh, okay. which uh, we can follow up on later. Okay, great.